Hello everyone! Welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. All videos here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. These are the six manuals that I used to develop this video. So, let's go to see them. So, the first is the principles of neuropsychology. The second, fundamentals of human neuropsychology. The third, it's the neuropsychology handbook. The fourth, it's the handbook of clinical neuropsychology. The fifth, it's a neuropsychological assessment from Lezac, which is a very good manual. And the sixth, it was the clinical neuropsychology from uh, Laura Gonstein and Jane McNeil. As you are seeing, neuropsychology is the scientific field that studies the relationships between brain, behavior and cognition. The notion that the brain is the organ of the mind and the brain is the organ of neurocognitive processes, it's not uh, new to us. However, this idea had been developed for many years. So, let's look to the story of neuropsychology and let's look to the story about how the brain starts to get noticed as the center of the mind. So, the notion of neuropsychology or the notion about the study of the relationship between brain and behavior can be traced uh, through ancient history or even earlier. There were too much debate uh, in different societies when we start to considering that the body and the mind could be related to different organs in our brain, in our mind. So for many centuries the brain was thought to be useless and discarded. This notion has been changed through time, through the evolution in anatomy and physiology. So let's take a brief overview on this. Mental functions were um, viewed from a religious point of view, and human mental dysfunctions were attributed to evil spirits and the gods. I think this is not a new, uh, a new information for you. So the brain has not always been considered the center of the functioning body. It took too many centuries to acknowledge that the importance of the brain as the organ of the mind. This is a core, core feature here. Now we know that the brain is the main organ of the mind. So many functions that our mind have would not be possible if the brain is not there, if the brain is not working, okay? So, even in antiquity, lots of uh, researchers tried to study the brain and they developed a technique called the trephination, which is defined as the ancient surgical operation that involves cutting, scrapping, chiseling and or drilling a plug-like piece of bone from the skull. As you can see here in this picture, the physicians tend to do some kind of hole in the brain and they try to study the brain within a living person. The classical Greeks wrote the first accounts of the brain and behavior relationships. Heraclitus uh, was one of the first philosophers that uh, say that the mind is an enormous space uh, with never-ending boundaries. So, um, he has the notion that the mind is a very, very huge domain which we may never look to his boundaries. However, Pythagoras, uh, a very well-known ancient Greek philosopher, was the first to suggest that the brain could be the center of the human reasoning and may play a role in the soul's life. So this is the fundamentals and the essentials of uh, the, the later became known as the, the brain hypothesis, which is the idea that the brain is the source of all behavior. So here, Heraclitus and Pythagoras were the first ones that 
uh, start to uh, develop the notion that maybe maybe the brain could be the center of the mind and also it could be the center of the soul. This is the fundamentals of the brain hypothesis. So, another ancient Greek, a very well-known ancient Greek, Hippocrates, which is the father of modern medicine, also believed that the brain controls all senses and movements. He studied some patients where paralysis occurred in the side of the body, opposite to the side of the head injury. This is very important because it's the first time in history that we start to get notice that the brain could be working on opposite sides of the body. This is very important. So, following the areas governed by the right and left hemispheres of the brain, Hippocrates noticed that uh, one side of the brain could lead to or could govern other areas, contralateral areas of the body. This is very important. So, Hippocrates also stated that pleasure, merriment, laughter, amusement, as well as grief, pain and anxiety could all arise from the brain. This is also a very important notion because we start to notice that not only a body movement but also some kind of mental states or states of mind could also arise from the brain and from the brain functioning. However, Plato suggested that the soul may be divided or could be divided in three different parts – appetite, reason and temper. This kind of notion had helped Freud to develop his notions about the mind, which is id, id or id, ego and superego. So Freud, um, do you know Freud? Of course, Freud starts to uh, use the notion of Plato to develop his own theory about conscious and unconscious mind. However, not all ancient philosophers believed that the, the brain was the center of the body. Not all ancient philosophers believed that the brain was the center of the body and the brain was important to behavior. Aristotle, which is also a very known uh, Greek philosopher, was a creative thinker in very fields. However, he made some mistakes. He believed that the heart could be the source of all mental processes and he developed which was known as the cardiac hypothesis, where the heart has the seat of every emotion and uh, the heart is the seat of every mental process. Later, in Egypt, Alexandria School developed some different notions. Scientists work hard in new advances in physiology and anatomy and knowledge of the nervous system and neuroanatomy were steamed from the performing of public dissections. So, um, these scientists uh, start to perform public dissections about dead people, however, these dissections had boosted the knowledge about the nervous system, which is also very important. So they start to develop which was later known as the ventricular localization hypothesis, which postulates that mental and spiritual processes may reside in the ventricular chambers of the brain. This hypothesis later became known as the cell doctrine, which means that the cell is a small compartment in a ventricle. This uh, theory, this doctrine, takes about 2000 years to be developed. So, together with Hippocrates, Galen was one of the greatest physicians of his time and he took different advances about the anatomic knowledge of the brain and uh, he may be coined as the first experimental physiologist which identified many of the major brain structure and described the behavioral changes uh, that was related to different brain traumas. So, Galen also described that all physical functions included in the brain, as well as the rest of the body, depends on the balance of the bodily fluids or humors, which he referred to air, water, fire and earth. He identified different brain areas which were related to different behaviors and different emotions. This was a major 
step on the understanding of the brain and on the understanding about how the brain could be the underlying organ of emotion and behavior. However, other authors were very important on the development of this idea that the brain is the organ of the mind. So later, Albert Magnus um, described that behavior results from a combination of brain structures that includes the cortex, the midbrain and the cerebellum. Andreas Vesalius found some Galen's anatomic mistakes and he corrected them. Particularly, he corrects those errors that were related to the role of the ventricles and their effect on behavior. Also, Descartes, as you, as you know, it's a very, very well-known uh, philosopher that split the mind and the brain into physical different identities. So, he split between mental processes and physical abilities and he stated that the mind and the body are separate. However, they may interact with each other. He stated that the pineal gland was the means by the body and the spirit, the body and the mind would interact. This is known as the, the dualism of the Descartes. Later, Thomas Willis described that the blood circulation in the brain and he theorized that all mental faculties reside in the corpus triatum, a structure that is uh, very deep within the cerebral hemispheres. So, as you can see here, different contributions from different authors start to emphasize different features of the brain functioning and the relationship between the brain and the mind or, in their words, the brain and the soul. So, now let's just summarize the contents of today. So, neuropsychology studies the relationship between brain, mind and behavior. Uh, the brain and antiquity was uh, an object of studies between the Greeks. However, the brain was not the center of the mind, was not the center of the soul and uh, the cell doctrine was a notion that stems from 2000 years of different discoveries about the workings of the mind and the workings of the brain and anatomic discoveries of the soul which we called anatomic discoveries of the mind were very important to establish the brain as the organ of the mind or in their language in their notions the organs of the soul well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme to see the manuals and the books that I am recommending to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!